Over to you, Minu, for this amazing gift of our 80th Pearl of Wisdom on joy. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and I'm going to begin. You're going to take care of the, the waiting room. That's fabulous. And just uh, giving you all a heads up, I'm here at a friend's place um, in, uh, in Delhi. And there are two bedrooms behind me. So just in case, inadvertently, there are people that open the room and get out. Don't be shocked or surprised about it. Um, so remain joyful. That's the key thing. So let's begin with joy. I mean, joy is the first of joy, ease, grace, omnipresent, Jago. And I've talked about joy in a variety of ways. I think we did a pearl of wisdom on enjoy at one point. And um, I thought that was, that was fine. It was taken care of. And actually, uh, joy by itself is a pearl of wisdom. And that's what we are going to be talking about. Uh, we also have a wonderful Siamese cat, by the way. So in case it starts to show up. <laughs> um, okay. So this particular pearl of wisdom, it's interesting. You know, the way, the way I, I received it is by, be, first of all, beginning with different areas of our, of our life where joy can very easily disappear. And the hack is associated with that particular life situation or that particular circumstance, which actually made it super practical. And I've used these hacks, some of them with myself, but many with the work that I have been doing with other people in those circumstances. So the first one is you know, the area that, um, that we are talking about here is a love interest in a relationship. So there you are, you know, completely in love and it's all going beautifully and certain things develop and certain things develop could be a misunderstanding, could be a misinterpretation, could be an unfulfilled expectation. But you don't necessarily know that an unfulfilled expectation is really a collection of unset communications that actually start to lead to unfulfilled expectations. And, um, you know, joy starts to disappear from that relationship. Even though when it began, it was, it looked absolutely perfect and brilliant. And then one thing leads to another and you have layers and layers of unfulfilled expectations layered on top of multiple unset communications. And joy goes further and further away and you start looking at other ways of bringing joy in your life, which in fact adds to the unsaid communications and therefore even, even, even more strongly increases the unfulfilled expectations until the relationship itself starts to feel like this is not what you signed up for. So, Here's the thing, here's the hack to bring joy back. And the hack basically is completion and co-creation. So in a love interest relationship, the moment you start sliding into that unfulfilled expectation, the moment you start sliding into just doesn't feel the way it used to, you know, maybe it is not meant to feel the way it is it, it used to. Maybe the circumstances have changed completely. Maybe um, that your your what your interests are have have deviated. Does not mean you can't continue in the relationship. This hack says completion and co-creation. So this hack is actually about adopt a practice of completing the way the relationship was. And rather than entering a realm where it becomes unrequited and you're constantly looking at if only it was the way it began and adding to your unfulfilled expectations from that point on, it is so much easier and so much better 
to actually say, okay, we are, you know, we seem to be, you know, diversifying or we seem to be developing different interests. Let's bring that freshness back. The way to bring freshness back is to really complete the way things were. Complete by acknowledging the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful in this relationship, all of it. And complete does not mean you end the relationship. You're really completing the, the already always um, listening and the, and the way things were and all that kind of stuff where you know, you develop certain habits and practices and certain ways of taking each other for granted and all those kind of things, certain mannerisms that you don't like. The idea here is to say, okay, we are completing the way the relationship was with the intention to co-create what we are going to make of it. And in that co-creation, now you are co collaborative co creators as opposed to codependent relators. So easy to slide into taking each other for granted and then looking for that freshness and that um, you know, exuberance that used to be when you just got together from somewhere else. Well, it's time for, for you to take it on for yourself with each other, for each other, for you together. This is a joy hack. I mean, it is so amazing. There's a, there's a program that I do very selectively, but I do it. It's called the Romance Refresher. And the, it's a romance refresher for people who've been in relationships. And you would have thought, we're talking about, you know, people who've been in relationships for a long, long time. Well, no, the romance refreshers, you know, the, the youngest couple I've had have been 23 and 26 on that. And the oldest has been 86 and 78. Now, this whole approach of completion. It is scary. I'm not saying it's not, but it also brings a little bit of that excitement in you. And Catherine, you were in fact on one of the Journey into Miracles in Bali with two couples who were going through exactly this. You know, it was a romance refresher experience that they were really engaged in, both Leah and, 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 and Sai and Jill. Leo, Oleg, and Sai and Jill, of different kinds. You know, both of them had been, had came together because they fell in love with each other. And then certain things happened. One couple had completely fallen out of love with each other. And another one was where one person, one of the couple was completely gripped by suspicion all the time. And it was nothing to do with the other partner at all, actually. She just had various body shaming issues for herself, really. And that's where that, that suspicion came from. There was no truth to it. And it, all that had happened was, you know, a, they had dated and that dating had become a relationship. It had just slid into a relationship. So I often say, you know, it's important to understand what is. You know, I often say that, look, dating is a date in your, in your schedule, in your calendar. It's not a relationship. When you're dating someone and then you decide to then go into a relationship, it's time to complete the dating part and consciously choose to step into we are now going to be in a relationship and you co-create that relationship. We, mostly people don't do that. 
One party assumes that they're in a relationship and when they see indications when the other one isn't behaving in the way they assumed, which they haven't yet expressed, joy just starts to disappear. So completion is extremely important. Remember, completion does not mean you are ending the relationship you are actually both declaring that the way things were, the way things have been, it is time to complete that way of behaving, that way of operating. And you just by saying that actually doesn't complete it. You know, many of you here are regulars with the work that I do. So I always talk about the power tool of acknowledgement. So by acknowledging constantly, you know, exactly what is, by acknowledging that, you know, this is what we are completing. This is the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful that we are completing on. You both acknowledge and receive each other and accept it. So when you do step into co-creation, by the time you get to that, to a point in, in completion acknowledgement, remember completion isn't about accusing. You know, it is like when you say, okay, we are gonna complete on this relationship. It's not about, well, you know, it wasn't like that. It was like this, it was like that. Well, it isn't about that. When the two of you together say, right, we're going to use this joy hack that Mina talks about in this relationship. Then you go and you, you start with, okay, we're going to complete. It is only a matter of acknowledging what you're completing. When you co-create, that is the time to redefine those aspects of your relationship, those ways of relating to each other that you are going to bring into your co-creation of how you are going to relate going forward. And I have seen it time and time and time again, it is age agnostic, you know, or it is even duration of relationship agnostic, where, where people go into this and when they get into co-creation, it literally is like they've just, just now, you know, declared their love for each other. There are times where people have gone into co-creation where they have chosen, we are actually not going to continue relating to each other in, as a romantic couple. But the completion has happened so powerfully that the co-creation establishes how they're going to go out into the world and show up uh, without carrying the baggage from one relationship to another, which often happens, a mistrust or whatever it might be. So when I do the romance refresher with people, I always say, you know, we're going to first bring joy back. And we apply this, this hack. And I do warn them that you, both of you may decide that you're actually not going to relate in this way before, uh, again. And you are gonna go your separate paths. When I chose to apply this joy hack on my relationship, when I returned from Bali all those years ago, our completion actually was a celebration of our 17 and a half years together. And we both chose that we are not going to continue as a couple anymore. And we both enthusiastically invited all our friends and family on a new, to a new beginnings party where everyone had the opportunity to share where they were at in their experience of us as a couple and where they were at, you know, in the context of the news that we had just shared 
and if they had anything that they would like to share with us as we both choose to step out into the world, you know, as friends, but not as a couple. And it was beautiful. Nobody needed to take any sides. We had friends, we had families, we had work colleagues. They all showed up. Because the one thing nobody expected in our circle, because we didn't argue or anything like that at all. It was all like, it felt like a perfect relationship. And it was, and it was time to complete it. So it was a very powerful new beginning. Now, what happens is in this particular one, if you don't get into that space of joy, there is a baggage, there is a hurt, there is an upset that is there in your field, how much of a, a bravado of a face you put on. So there is a, a deep seated skepticism and sometimes a cynicism which propels you into sabotaging any new relationship that you may get into. So applying this joy hack is foundational. We're going to go to the next one. We could have a whole session, like a nugget of wisdom on just this. So there was a question I remember Catherine asking, and we did a whole session on it, which is when enough is enough, you know? And that when enough is enough, where you get to a point of like desperate frustration, you don't ever need to get to that. You know, you feel it within you when you start questioning if, if it's time or if it's even worth it, apply the joy hack. It's time to complete and co-create. In either direction, it's actually really, as you start completing, there's a point, there's a turning point where it's as if you feel unleashed you've like taken that control back. And the other person also feels unleashed. And joy starts to come in. And you then decide, okay, now it's time to co-create. So what is this going to look like? So in my case, when we did, we decided, okay, we are not gonna be a couple anymore. And we were co-creating, what is it going to look like? You know, it was quite exciting. I chose, okay, I'm just going to move out of London, you know, go on an adventure. And for my partner, it was like, okay, it's going to be an adventure of sorts for me too. And I'm going to start exploring because we'd been together for 17 and a half years and we were also in business together. So like, you know, most of our time was spent together. It was actually pretty, really powerful to say, okay, how is this going to happen? It wasn't about the relationship. We truly were honoring each other for the choices that we'd made. And, you know, we were like sharing with each other, you know, you have this particular special talent that I'm really happy to connect you with these three people that actually might support you to apply that talent. And, you know, and the vice versa, you know, you, you have this very special gift. So let's, let's look at what you might be able to do with that. We were actually supporting each other. You would not imagine that it was ending a relationship conversation because it wasn't. It was a completion of our time together as a couple. And now we are going to honor each other's individuality and hold the stand that we continue having a fulfilling life, but this time not as a couple. And joy was present, even in that. There were others who had unsaid communications about uh, our relationships, which basically meant that they got a, quite upset, which is why we did, together decided we're going to have a happy endings party. Let's bring everybody in. Nobody needs to hold anything within them about us. And let's really celebrate a new beginning. Now that's what we chose to do. 
And we did go on. I mean, I would not be here doing what I'm doing now if we hadn't done that. There would have been a nice, nice good dollop of guilt, added to it another flavor of shame, added to it another, you know, um, flavor of regret and tons of toppings of pride and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and that is what I would have carried on every session that I would do with people. Because that you, you, you are the energy signature of what you're experiencing and you bring that into any situation. So let's look at the next one. The next circumstance is a sibling situation where you, know, you are, you have a sibling and some things have occurred, you know, maybe from the time that you were being, you, you were um, being brought up and you've chosen to carry that. So there is that rivalry. There is the already always taken for granted listening or um, there is um, certain accusations or certain ways in which you feel that the other person behaves or whatever it might be. We don't talk to each other. My brother is always this way, you know. Um, I can't really expect anything from my sister or she's just too demanding. I'm just not going to tell her anything right now. All that kind of stuff. So when you have that kind of a situation, the joy hack is different. A sibling is a sibling is a sibling. And you can say whatever, that we don't have a relationship with each other. We're done with it. You could go into all that kind of stuff. But it actually, you know, when you are a sibling, there is a blood relationship that is there. You have come together to share each other's magnificence with, with, with each other. It's a soul agreement stuff. It is no, there is no accident. You've chosen to be siblings. The growth hack in this situation is sameness celebration. Celebration of sameness. Acknowledging your differences, well, you are acknowledging them all the time. Doesn't do anything. All it does is it really reinforces we are so different. And these aspects of our differences just don't agree with me. And you keep going down these rabbit holes of disagreements, the sibling situation does not give you joy, does not turn into joy. But when you start looking at what's same about us, and it, it could be certain facial features, certain mannerisms, certain ways in which you think when you're in a particular situation, then you can look at your differences and it becomes such a, it becomes a laughing matter. Not because you're overriding them. You can then acknowledge the differences as a celebration, actually, of sorts. And, you know, I, I, I actually did this with my own, one of my own siblings. There's an age difference of 10 years between us. And I was always, I was the first a child of this new generation, when 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 my generation of of um, siblings were born, and you know I come from India, so um, cousins and all of that, we are all very close. We are all siblings, basically. It's it's that kind of thing. Even though someone is a cousin, it's it's not seen. We don't see it like that. We are just we are, we are siblings. And I just happen to be this. Um, uh, I was a rebel, yes, but I also knew that if I just studied really hard and got fabulous grades, all of my rebelliousness will be tolerated in a way that it will give me the freedom to do, to go on adventures that I like to go. Because that's what my elders expected people of my generation to do, to do really well in education. I put a lot of pressure on my siblings in doing that. 
my, my siblings noticed the adventurer that I was and they would be told, told, you know, you've got to behave like her. Look at her, how well she does in school. And look, she got this award and look, she was a, performed and had this amazing accolade for the dance performance, all sorts of stuff. Look, she's an all rounder, you know, tremendous pressure on my siblings. So the chances of this, you know, the, the difference and unsaid communications would stack up. And one unsaid communication results in a hundred unfulfilled expectations. So you can imagine lots of unsaid communications. I was someone who was out there, not a match for most of my siblings. So there was, there was a massive difference. So they didn't necessarily even talk to me. So we had a major situation occur much, much later on in life where, you know, my sibling, where there was this 10 year difference, she just had an outburst at one particular point about how, um, you know, I was this, this person and everybody had to like put away the way they like to behave just so that they could emulate me. I wasn't asking them to do it, but it was all attributed to me, you know, because I was doing, behaving in a certain way, everybody was pressurized. So she was like, you know, you're so, and, and I wasn't empathetic at all to anyone because I was so focused on studying and getting the grades so I could go on my adventures. I didn't necessarily notice what was going on around me, but all of that had built up. So we applied, I, I applied the sameness ha uh, uh, celebration hack to bring joy back. If I said at that time that, look, I wasn't doing anything. All I was doing, all I wanted was to be able to go on my adventures. So I was just delivering to the adults what they expected. I didn't realize it was having this effect on all of you. I had no idea. If I had said that, it, and I did attempt to, before I applied the hack, I'm not a superhuman, <laughs> it did happen, you know, and, and there was like an explosion. And I was like hit, wow, such strong feelings for something that I had no idea was going on. And I decided, okay, pause. No point in having a discussion about our differences or different situations or different points of view, let's really look at what's same about us. So after my sibling had expressed all of that, then I went into, you know, can we just take a few moments to look at what's same about us? And we just couldn't help ourselves laughing at certain um, habits and nuances of practices and, and all of that that we have the way we think. And we actually decided, okay, we're gonna just complete the way we related as, as siblings up to this point in time, and we're gonna co-create a new way in which it becomes a sibling friendship and a sibling camaraderie with which we will go out and express ourselves in the world. So what does that look like? Okay, what samenesses are we going to build on? It was cool. It was so much fun to do it. But it began by celebrating our sameness and honoring our individuality. So th the thing that I learned from this, which is why I call these joy hacks, that you know, there are circumstances and situations that happen in all our lives. The first thing is to use one of these hacks, get joy back in. That gives you, you know, a whole and completeness with which you can choose to step forward in your life. And then you can go do co-creation, you can do whatever it is that you want. So in a sibling situation, it is sameness celebration. In a love interest relationship situation, 
where joy has gone missing, it is completion and co-creation of the next phase. The third circumstance is a work relationship situation. We, you know, when this happens, people even go as far as saying, ah, I just don't even want to be in a job. I hate this company. I hate this team. But actually you'll find it's only to do with one or two very specific relationships in, that, in the workplace. Even if you feel that you're not being acknowledged in a team situation, before you just write off the team, go into this joy hack. Identify if there is a, a, a relationship at work that you want to bring joy back in. It's all about you bringing joy back to yourself. And the other person will join in or they may not. The idea is you get into a state of joy and make your choices coming from that space so that you don't carry a baggage that depletes vital life force and continues to take joy away. Remember, it's when you have joy is where happiness as a decision starts to set in. So the joy hack in a work situation is listening for magnificence. We are all magnificent beings in human disguise and it is only the human disguise that gets fractured. The magnificence remains the same. Even if the first time you met someone and you felt that heebie-jeebies and it gave you the creeps, okay, whatever it is, that's all coming from their fractures in their human disguise and fractures in your own human disguise about how you associate with people with those kind of behaviors. Magnificence is the same. You do it for yourself. When you start experiencing a breakdown in a workplace, you start dishonoring your own worthiness there. And that's a subconscious choice. When you choose to continue to be there, somewhere that does not give you joy, you are dishonoring your own worthiness. Because your own inner need is not to do not experience joy in, in your in the way you choose to live your life. So listening for magnificence, you stop listening for your own magnificence. Gives you permission to devour that in others. So by listening for magnificence, you literally make a choice just for the heck of it. You make a choice where you choose to listen to these people who may be in interrupting joy in your workplace and you consciously choose to find those elements that are magnificent about them. And that may just be the way someone grooms themselves. It may just be how they just know the tone of voice to use in which situation. And everything else may be pretty awful, doesn't matter. My point here is when you listen for magnificence, it's that magnificence that starts to shine through. And people start stepping into and owning their own magnificence. When you listen for magnificence, you listen for magnificence within you as much as you do in others. And that's why listening for magnificence. And you will find work-related work situations actually transform, joy sets in, and you can then make a choice. I want to stay in this work, I want to move out, whatever it may be. But you're doing it from a space of strength. And it's a joyful decision, as opposed to, you know, I hate all forms of uh, corporates, I hate all forms of employment, whatever. We develop these, and I've, you know, I, I also chose to step away from a corporate career. But if I had held 
this negative connotation about corporates are always whatever, whatever, I would not have been able to create a phenomenal business and an offering of building inspired leaders, which actually, you know, the foundation of that success was corporations who gave me the, the amounts of money and the size of contracts that enabled this business of mine that I had created, choosing to step away from a corporate career to be supremely successful. Carrying a baggage about a particular type of workplace or a particular type of work is actually burdening you. Listening for magnificence to bring that joy back in you about the workplace and about certain type of personalities or certain particular individuals is an important aspect of you choosing where you go next in the context of the workplace or the kind of work you do. Let's look at the fourth one. The fourth situation is a loneliness hack. A loneliness hack. So much of this stuff is going on. You can be in a relationship. You can be in the middle of a family and be totally and utterly lonely. You have no time for yourself whatsoever. Not because others are taking it away. You may blame them. You're giving it away to them. And you feel really, really lonely and alone. Loneliness and aloneness are two different things. We'll do a nugget of wisdom on loneliness at some point. Very powerful stuff that I've received. So the loneliness joy hack is rampage of acknowledgement and appreciation. But you're alone. You're feeling lonely. Who are you going to acknowledge and appreciate? So this was an interesting one for me. And I received this particular joy hack in the context of loneliness uh, when I went on a 15 days of silence and loneliness was really the topic. And I thought, you know, this is so crazy. I'm, I'm following my guidance to go on 15 days of silence. And I'm here in this retreat center, you know, which is linked to a Buddhist monastery outside of Perth in Western Australia. And I happen to be alone in this 93 acre estate. I've had this agreement with the head monk that I was going to do my own silence retreat. And I thought, and I'm going to spend 15 days alone and I'm actually going to engage in a study of loneliness does not light me up at all. <laughs> and I thought, well, what better time to be implementing these different hacks, you know, um, when I am actually alone and I could very easily slide into loneliness, being alone is one thing, you know, the loneliness part actually brings in a variety of anxieties and anguishes and abandonment issues and a whole variety of things. Alone, you can be on an adventure. Loneliness is linked to a collection of meanings that we give to our various experiences and layer upon layer upon layer makes us feel that, you know, nobody really cares. And that is what results in loneliness. So the loneliness hack is rampage of acknowledgement and appreciation. And this is how you work with the hack. This is where you really go into a lay of the land. And a lay of the land is applied to different times in your life where you were supported where you did experience a feeling of gratitude for someone else, for another person, for another organization. You actually go on a rampage of acknowledging. What are you actually acknowledging here? What I got from my study of loneliness was that we are actually never alone never alone, because we make soul agreements, even before we take birth. And soul agreements are made not just with what is 
um, like sometimes flippantly termed as soulmates, soul agreements are made with various people that we are going to engage with, interact with throughout our life. So once you accept that, they're okay, you know, and even if you don't understand it, I didn't understand the soul agreement stuff. But I decided to go with it because, okay, I had 15 days, you know, to master this thing. Uh, <laughs> so I just literally went into, okay, I don't mind taking, you know, who are the people that have made a difference to me in the last two years? Who are the people that had made a difference to me five years prior to that? 15 years prior to that? 20 years prior to that? What difference did they actually make? Are there things that they have done that I would really want to appreciate? I expected a few names to be on that list. I expected a few organizations to be on that list. I actually did not expect my, you know, my first husband or, uh, you know, the one where I had experienced domestic violence for 10 years. I never expected him to be on there at all. But my God, there were so many things that he actually did that I do appreciate. So the first step here is you literally start listing <clears throat> the peoples and organizations or institutions and even experiences with where others are involved that you feel are worthy of acknowledging as, as people or organizations that have made a difference. And then you go into what do I appreciate about the difference that they have made? Now, by the time, I mean, I found myself, by the time I had come towards the end of the last five years, I was not lonely anymore. I realized that, my gosh, I wouldn't even recognize some of the people that had made such a difference to my life. I never acknowledged them. And I felt compelled to, not as a have to, as a matter of choice, to pick up the phone and reach out to some of these people, wanting to share what I had uncovered about the difference they had made to my life. That alone just took the lone, uh, aloneness away. And I realized I was never alone. I have soul friends everywhere everywhere, all the time. And they show up as earth angels, I call them. All the time. I don't have to push anyone away. So loneliness is only when we start pushing our soul connections away. Even if you feel you're in the midst of a family, or with friends, each one is so engrossed in themselves that you put on your guard, said, okay, I don't really need anyone. I'm not gonna let this affect me. And, and that's where you put yourself in the loneliness box. And you start looking through a lens of loneliness is my reality. And you start acknowledging, look, you know, this person calls himself my friend and hasn't taken his eye off his, his phone for the last 10 minutes, I, as if I just don't exist. Well, you can, you can acknowledge that. And you can also acknowledge that clearly they have got something else that is on their mind and they're choosing to be here present with me. Okay, I give them the space, but I don't take my presence away. There is a soul connection, that's why we are here. What has this person done for me in the past? What has been there about our relationship to each other in the past that I do acknowledge and appreciate? You can engage with that, bring joy in. I have broken patterns of cyber addiction. Certainly within, I mean, I was a major cyber addict, you know until my son did this thing on my phone and it became grayscale. Uh, which, I mean, it was because I asked for it to be, right? 
<clears throat> and it didn't take very long. And, and now my cyber usage is actually extremely low. I do track it just because I like to. But I realized how much of a cyber addict was I when I noticed that in others. So it would be like, I've traveled all this way here to London and you know we are getting together. We've got you know, a couple of hours and you spend the last 45 minutes to and fro on phones and, and texts. Well, doesn't actually make anyone feel that great. Instead, I chose to be an observer of what is it? And why am I even here? Why am I even choosing to meet this person? Clearly they've made a difference to my life before. What is the difference they've made? What do I appreciate about that? And the connection or the reconnection that emerged from that was phenomenal. Filled both our hearts with joy. They, need, they, they didn't need to, they didn't feel the need to go back to their cyber toys. But it began with me finding that joy. And it was the loneliness hack that I used. So the first thing to get about the loneliness hack is a knowing, understand you are not alone. You can choose to be feel lonely, but that is a meaning you have given to some stuff. Because lonely in its innate vibration is sapping of vitality. So you can be super busy, tremendously in demand. And I was one of those high performers in my corporate days. Super busy, high performers, completely lonely. There was no one I could share how I felt about certain things or certain situations because the expectations of me as a super high performer that delivers was so high that I just simply had to put on that front and keep going, going, going until my physical body collapsed. The mental had already, you know, um, shut out. I thought it was becoming sharper. It wasn't, it was just becoming jaded. Emotions were completely dishonored by me for myself because I was making me lonely. It's like, oh, nobody really cares about what, how I feel. Well, that wasn't true. They truly cared. That's why they were giving me the jobs that they were giving me. I was just choosing not to share it with them. And I was full of phenomenal soul uh, agreement, partnerships that were playing out all around me. I was choosing to be lonely. So by simply bringing this joy hack in, rampage of acknowledgement and appreciation, I didn't say rampage of appreciation, I said rampage of acknowledgement. Go on a rampage of acknowledging who are the players that have been in your life that have come, come in over the years. And those players, sometimes, even if you are someone who's been in, in, in a complete isolation, it, it could be nature, it could be what, whatever the situation may be, there are players that have come in for you to be where you are today. Acknowledge them, find what's there to appreciate about those players, about your experiences with them. Joy comes in, now you get a fuller perspective and remember the magic of the seven perspectives that perspective give you, gives you. Our 79th pearl of wisdom. And it's literally, you go and go on from there. The moment any semblance of loneliness is there, apply the joy hack for loneliness. Rampage of acknowledgement and appreciation. Let's look at the fifth circumstance. The fifth circumstance is relationship to yourself. 
And the joy hack is a truly madly deeply. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. Relationship to yourself. The sort of things that can take joy away. You know, body shaming is one of those. Berating yourself. Oh, I always do this. Oh, I always sabotage my relationships. Ah, that's only me. All that kind of stuff that occurs. So here, you really, to get into a space of joy, you apply the joy hack of what do I truly, madly, deeply love about myself? When I first asked about, uh, asked this question of myself, it was like, well, what's this truly, madly, deeply? Okay, I like this, I like that. I never got a list to begin with. I did it for the sake of, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really understand this thing about self-love. It was something I just took for granted, but actually taking it for granted itself took that love out of myself. By acknowledging what do I truly madly deeply love about myself? That was the question. And my initially, when I went on this, I would go, uh, I really like this, but, and I like that part, but not, not in this situation, not in that color. I mean, it's like really ridiculous. And it wasn't ridiculous because I just had never thought about it. I'm saying ridiculous now, but at that time, I just couldn't think beyond it. It's like, what kind of a question is this? truly madly deeply in love is with another person. You cannot be truly madly deeply in love with anyone if you are not so with yourself. And, you're, and if you're not so with yourself, you don't feel that vibration of love within yourself. You don't feel the vibration of love within yourself. You're disconnected from the innate vibration of being human, which is love. And with that disconnect, you show up in the world, disconnected, conflicted, very easy, like a like a, a, um, uh, someone who is just ready to be conflicted or go into an explosion just because of this lack of connection. But it's nothing to do with the outside. It's really the relationship with yourself. Joy in your own presence is missing. And you go into, well, to have joy, I really need to do it with other people. I'm a people person. Well, you may be a people person. It will drive them crazy if you're not able to be with yourself. So this, tru this truly madly deeply hack is an important one for yourself. <coughs> this is a relationship to your self hack. And it is and it is identifying what you truly, madly, deeply, unequivocally love about yourself. If, if you can find one thing, you can embellish that one thing in terms of, you know, what about, what about this that I really love? I remember when I was doing this for myself the first time, the only thing I've, I identified about myself that I truly, madly, deeply loved was the texture of my skin. I couldn't think of anything else. And then I thought, well, what about the texture of my skin that I really like? And I know it was the skin tone. It was just the way it felt. Um, the way it was sort of a little bit bouncy. And then I thought, well, that's so physical. I'm so focused on this physical stuff. Um, mentally, what do I love about myself? But I, I wasn't able to even think the mental stuff before. I had to have. So when you do a relationship, when you do a joy hack, you always begin with something very tangible. That's the key thing. So, you know, really something physical in each of these hacks. Don't just only find mental stuff. 
If it is not anchored in physical, joy doesn't last. So by anchoring it in physical <clears throat> and then going from there, <clears throat> I was able to look at myself in a full spectrum way. So look at it like that. Find what you truly, madly, deeply love about yourself physically. The moment you find something physically first, it's anchored. The joy is anchored. You can now expand and go to mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, and environmentally. <clears throat> By the time I got to emotionally, I was completely dancing in joy. If I had started that way, it would be, oh yes, but this piece is not that great. Yeah, you know, I just love interacting with people. I love going on vacations. I love, you know, seeing these, um, the seven wonders of the world, but, um, you know, I really need to lose weight before I can go on these adventures. I really need to have so much more money before I could do that. When you begin with physical, somehow those butts disappear. <clears throat> and you just acknowledge what is. See how exciting this is. And we are just on number five. So let's go to the sixth one. <laughs> The sixth one is flow of money and abundance. Again, this is another very important circumstance that can take joy away. So the joy hack in a situation where you're experiencing flow of money or abundance issues, it really is about flow. So the hack is, the joy hack is flow with what is. It's really about experiencing flow. Flow stops when you are out of flow. If there is no match to flow in you, nothing will flow to you because it'll just get stuck. It'll get stagnant or it'll get so hot to handle, you could self-combust. So the joy hack is flow with what is. And a situation with money, where there's lack of flow of money or a lack of experience of abundance, and then you apply this hack of flow with what is. You know, I, I personally had a situation at one point where I had structured my life and I chose to step away from London you know, because I was working on some of my investments that they would actually release a lump sum for me. And I would have at least the next 12 months. And I, if I work cleverly with the lump sums that were released, then I could have the next five years to do whatever it is that I want. And I structured it quite well. And I went to live in Bali. So then my expenses were not as much as they were in London. So it, it looked like it was all, all okay except when the lump sum arrived, <clears throat> there were certain accounting glitches that happened, which basically meant that it could take me many months of being in London to actually have that lump sum be released into uh, an account that would give me cash flow. And it was, it became very complicated. So now suddenly, you know, what I had banked on and embarked on this adventure because it was all on track and it was all a matter of just certain last minute processes that were you know, with the financial institution to be completed. I'd done all my part. There's no reason for any complication whatsoever. And lo and behold, something occurred. So then it was like, okay, I didn't feel joy. I felt anxious at the time. And by that time I had got used to living an extraordinary life where joy, ease and grace was, was present. It was available on tap and it was omnipresent. So something physical and big like this, taking joy away was literally affecting me in a full spectrum way. So I went with, what do I have right now? 
finding flow with what is. I was living in a beautiful place. I had fabulous friends eating amazing food. The weather was great. Sunshine was there. Connection with animals was there. Being under the Milky Way that I could even see as the Milky Way was half an hour out of town. And I had a great car that would take me around. And I started getting into flow. It only took a few days for the flow of money and abundance to actually kick in by itself. I didn't focus on that at all. But the moment I found, found, brought joy back and started flowing with joy by acknowledging what is, flow literally got activated. The seventh <clears throat> circumstance is a well being hack. When you feel there is a chronic illness or pain or whatever it is, the hack there is. Find that needle in the haystack. If you're, if you're like consumed by a wellness situation, very easy to be consumed and lost in it. Find that needle in a haystack. And literally, one thing leads to another and you realized you are, you had these acres of diamonds embedded and crusted in your, in your body that actually are really well. Even if you might have this 2% or 10% that is unwell. But by, by bringing joy back into your well-being, you literally enter this acres of diamonds and your body has the space to recalibrate. Joy Bringing joy in anything where you don't feel joy is essential for a complete transformation of your experience of living your life. Use the joy hacks. And remember, it's different joy hacks for different circumstances. It's a hack. You know, you can apply one hack to another. It'll just take a little bit longer. I've given you exactly the hack to use in different circumstances. So over to you, Catherine. Okay. This is a record for the number of pages in my note taking. Just saying that we could have used at least another hour. And I loved the beginning. I loved the middle. I loved the end. I hope you all agree. We will be hearing more about this, I'm sure, from Minu. And thank you all. I know we're out of time. Thank you, Minu. It's always a pleasure. Great to see you all tonight. And look forward to our 81st next week. Practice Thank the joy you. hacks, okay? There are lots of circumstances that we will go through between now and the next time we meet. So hack away. <laughs> I love it. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.